and navicular. The joints involved include the tailor navicular joint, the subtalar joint, the calcaneocuboid joint, and the ankle joint. With respect to the talus, in clubfoot, the body of the talus is seen to be smaller, the neck orientation in relation to the body is changed, and the position of the tailor head and joint surfaces is also altered. So I've tried to demonstrate in this slide um, those features pictographically. The neck of the talus is deviated more medially and plantarward relative to the body. In addition to the exaggerated plantar and medial posture of the neck, there is a change in the torsional relationship. In the normal infant foot, the head is rotated with respect to the long axis of the tailor neck. So the picture on the right is the left foot where the tailor head would normally be torted externally in, related to the in relation to the neck. But the shaded red shows the club foot tailor head internally torted. The calcaneus is again smaller the orientation and shape of the articular surface are changed with underdevelopment of the sustentaculum. The anterior articular surface is directed downwards medially and inverted and the angle of the posterior facet reduced. The navicular is elongated and wedge shaped, broader and on its lateral and dorsal surfaces. So now looking at the relationship between the bones, the deformed talus lies in increasing degrees of equinus within the ankle joint. The medial angulation of the tailor neck gives the subtalar joint a medial spin and the calcaneus follows, reducing the tailor calcaneal angle with the interosseous ligament acting as a fulcrum. The calcaneus rotates in more than one plane with the anterior calcaneus moving down and in and the posterior calcaneus moving up and out. The heel appears to be in various because the calcaneus rotates through the subtalar joint in the coronal plane and horizontally. Deformity is maintained by contracture of the joint capsule and capsular ligaments, which are grossly affected by the pathology. There is contracture of the capsule and posterior tibiotalar ligament. The talar fibula and tibiofibular ligaments are contracted. The tibiocalcaneal, talocalcaneal, and calcaneofibular ligaments are shortened and thickened. The Achilles is short and tight. Tibialis posterior and the long flexors are contracted. On the posterolateral aspect, the perineal sheath is contracted and thickened. And then coming to the midfoot, the calcaneocuboid joint is displaced medially. The navicular is displaced medially from the head of the talus, and the tailor head is exposed. The metatarsals are fixed in equina varus. These pictures are from Ippolito's paper and show cross sections through the level of the tip of the medial malleolus. On the left, the, pathologi sorry, the pathological left foot seen here on the right shows the displacement of the navicular with the exposed um, tailor head and the navicular butts the tip of the medial malleolus. The contractures of the soft tissues on the medial side maintain the cava varus, including tight joint capsules, um, contracture of the deltoid and spring ligaments and the plantar ligaments. The plantar muscles and abductor halysis are also contracted, contributing to the equina varus. Muscle compartments of the leg are involved with contracture of the triceps surae, tip posterior and long flexors, and the perineal tendon sheath is thickened and contracted. The calf can be seen to be smaller and remain so throughout life. There's also an abnormal relationship of muscle fibres to connective tissue. So just going back to the clinical examination, I just want to take this opportunity to emphasise the importance of examining the whole child. And at first presentation, it's critical to take a full history, assess the appearance of the baby, examine the spine and hips and exclude conditions associated with CTEV, such as arthrogryposis or spina bifida. The deformity can be seen on inspection with the medial crease demonstrating cavus adduction and supination of the midfoot, the lateral curvature of the foot and the deep posterior crease demonstrating equinus. We examine the, um, the emptiness of the heel uh, looking for the position of the calcaneus and the rigidity of the equinus. We like to score our babies using the Pirani score, which I know will be mentioned later. And we do that with e at each visit to assess progression of correction. 
On closer inspection, the flexibility of the deformity should be assessed. We not uncommonly see a reasonable number of children with furs with positional club foot, and it's important to assess the correctability of the deformity. Taylor head is palpated by first identifying the distal fibula and then moving the thumb distally and anteriorly. With the other hand, the forefoot can be abducted around the tailor navicular joint. The positional club foot will allow simultaneous dorsiflexion at the ankle, which won't be seen in the pathological foot. And remember to look for signs of the atypical foot, which again will be discussed later. But these pictures just demonstrate the abnormal medial crease that can traverse the whole foot in, with an atypical club foot and the short elevated hallux that may raise concerns. Thank you. I'll pass over to my colleagues. Thank you. That was excellent overview and very informative talk. Uh, any questions or any comments? Okay, so uh, since we don't have any questions, we'll move on to the next talk uh, by Tim Nunn on the classification systems. Thanks. Good afternoon and good evening, everybody. Um, <clears throat> thank you again for the invitation. So I'm, I'm uh, talking from Ethiopia, the capital of Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, which is about 2,500 miles uh, west of Kerala. Um, so we see, we see a lot of club foot here, and uh, the vast majority of which is uh, untreated, uh, so-called uh, neglected. Um, and my, my talk today is looking at uh, scoring systems for uh, delayed presenting club feet, particularly focusing on the PAVER score, uh, which was developed here in Ethiopia. So, <clears throat> as I've mentioned, the majority of the feet that we see are delayed presenting. Um, infant club foot services here are, are very sparse. The um, majority of those under the age of 10 still do respond to Ponsetti principles of, of manipulation and casting. Um, and uh, um, essentially we needed a score uh, that predicts cast response. Uh, so um, the services for delayed presenting club foot are uh, the moment in development um, with provincial towns uh, really um, taking uh, some of the burden off of our institution in providing this care. What we wanted was a score that essentially predicts the response to casting and so that we can determine which case needs referral to our, our centre, which is Cure Ethiopia, and which could be managed more locally. So <clears throat> in terms of uh, clubfoot, Obviously, there's a vast spectrum of deformity and problems. And in this uh, presentation, I'm not talking about the atypical club foot. As you can see here on the left side, there's profound amount of um, plantaris and cavus deformity. And I'm not talking about syndromic club foot uh, with this um, constriction band syndrome case or neurological foot either um, or recurrent for that matter. So this is looking at uh, the boy, which is on the right-hand side of the screen, which is a congenital idiopathic uh, club foot. So we've been managing these cases, as I'd said, up to the age of 10 years of age with um, serial manipulation casting, and then a surgical approach, which is limited and requires um, a posterior Achilles tendon lengthening uh, followed by uh, tibialis anterior tendon transfer at the end, once adequate dorsiflexion has been achieved. 
<clears throat> the existing scores are exceptionally well known, in, in, you know, particularly the Pirani score. Uh, but in the older foot, there are some issues. And as it turns out, it, it is not very helpful. There are no posterior and medial creases to observe on most of these delayed presenting club feet. And we did a study uh, which showed that there was in fact very poor agreement uh, between observers on whether the Taylor head was covered in these feet or not, and whether the heel was empty or not. And there did always seem to be a curved lateral border and significant cast atrophy. So reducing the discrimination uh, effect of, of, of these elements of the scoring systems. So we concluded that the Pirani score uh, wasn't super helpful for our population. And in addition, um, we, we wanted to see what the um, amount of deformity was after some correction. So you can see here, this lad on the left, on his left foot has uh, significant standing deformity, but is in fact very flexible. So what we wanted to do was have a scoring system that looked at fixed deformity. So uh, our scoring system that we developed is, has the acronym PAVA, and it depends upon measuring fixed deformities of these angles below. So P is for plantaris, A for adductus, V for varus, E for equinus, which is equinus at the hind foot, and rotation around the Taylor head. Uh, and uh, those elements are then summed and multiplied by an age-related factor to give us the paver score. We know from experience uh, that it's not only the age of the child, but it's also the severity of the fixed deformity which contributes to resistance to casting. So here we have a diagram which shows these elements, uh, plantaris, and that is the, the, the that is measured. I'll, I'll show in a, in a moment a an example. Uh, the apex of that is around the calcaneal cuboid joint. Uh, adductus, again, the apex of that is around the calcaneal cuboid joint, varus at the hind foot, equinus at the ankle, and rotation around the Taylor head. So the club foot score was, this club foot score, the paver score, was developed from the Demeglio score and used, used those measured angles. Um, and it was combined with age as a multiplier uh, to give a maximum score of 30. It's not exactly the same as the De Meglio score. And what we've done in the scoring system is to define out the uh, plantaris and the equinus. So they're two separate aspects of this score, which is combined as one in the De Meglio original. We looked at the interrater and the intra-observer variability for four raters and found a very reasonable agreement. And when we grouped them for mild, moderate and severe deformities, we found excellent agreement. So I just want to go through a worked example to try and explain this further. So here is the, the first bit, which is plantaris. Uh, and as you can see here, plantaris is um, relatively mild, 10 degrees. And anything between zero and 20 degrees scores a one. So this scores is, score is one. A is for adductus. And here you can see there's a moderate amount of adductus and um, measured, measured angles of between 20 and 45 degrees scores a two. So this scores two. Uh, Varus is a V. Um, and here you can see it's quite mild. And we see that quite a lot in these um, delayed presenting club feet uh, in that the, the varus is not a significant feature. Um, that scores one as it's above zero degrees, but less than 20. Uh, equinus is often a very significant component of uh, the deformity. And of course, when the ankle is plantigrade or in neutral position, that would be zero degrees of Aquinas. But here you can see 
um, the amount of Aquinas is actually 58 degrees, which is above 45 and scores three. Uh, finally, after rotation around the tailor head, so we've drawn a line down the foot, uh, down, the, down the tibia, uh, intersecting with the exposed tailor head, and then up between the second and third toe interspace up towards the exposed tailor head and measured the resulting angle, uh, which is 44 degrees here. That's uh, less than 45, but greater than 20, which scores a two. So for these measured angles, they're conv converted into those points uh, for plantaris adductus ferus aquinas and rotation, and then added up. And then the sum of those component points is multiplied by an age-related factor. And you can see the, uh, the age multiplier is displayed on the screen there. Uh, this child is eight years old, so the, the multiplier is two, and the PAVA score therefore is 18 out of 30. And from our experience, um, around 18 to 20 is in fact the cutoff for uh, cast um, correction um, resistance. So we know that a score over 20 and above will likely be resistant uh, to casting. That doesn't mean to say that casting would be ineffective, but for our triage tool, uh, we know that it would probably be best done at a specialist uh, centre, anticipating um, further problems down the road. So we did a validation study on this to look at uh, whether the score was valid in terms of, did it correlate with the number of casts needed to correct the deformity and with pedobiography? Our, our hypothesis was that it would take more casts to create to correct a higher paver score. And um, those with higher paver scores would have smaller footprints and greater pressure points. So we looked at 100 club feet, um, all children between the age of two and 10, and all work, walked on a pedobiograph mat. And we charted the number of casts to full correction. Um, we discontinued casting if they'd had nine changes and had either plateaued or had not responded. So uh, looking at our results, um, we found that there was a significant association between the paver score and the number of casts needed to correct the midfoot. So here you have um, the paver score along the x-axis and those that successfully corrected and those that failed casting on the y-axis. And you can see there, there seems to be a clear cutoff around 18 to 20, uh, whereby uh, a paver score of that amount essentially means that casting is not going to correct the midfoot. So our conclusion was that uh, the, the ease of correction is related to the paver score um, that out of 100 feet, about 11% uh, failed to respond fully uh, to the casting. And a, a PAVER score of 18 to 20 pre pre predicts failure. Um, in terms of uh, pedobiography, we showed that, as expected, that the, the smaller the footprint area, the higher the score. And in terms of pressure, the higher the pressures, the higher the score. So our overall conclusions were that there was a good, good association between number of casts to achieve correction with the paver score, and that it was a useful score to predict uh, success of cast treatment at the age of 10 and under in these idiopathic feet. I wish to thank you for listening to this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, any questions from any of the faculties? Yeah, Atul, please. Uh, hi, Tim. That's, uh, that was a great uh, talk uh, on a new scoring system. 
just one uh, couple of question one is did, did you also take uh, into consideration the tibial torsion which they get at that age the older children whether uh, that corrects itself as well and whether some of your rotation uh, tibial rotation uh, the the tailor rotation also actually measured uh, tibial torsion uh, and the other point is uh, if two children have a similar pave uh, score say age 5 and age 10 age related correlation between number of cast uh, purely on the age rather than uh, the pave score also is there any uh, can you shed some light on that yeah no they're both excellent questions can i just can i just address the second one first sure, so sure. with regard to yeah with regard to the casting number and age uh, we found that uh, both age and the severity of the deformity are independent factors um when we look at uh, response to casting. Uh, we, yeah, we, we thought that there may be a link, of course, um, you know, the older child, the more difficult, um, and that's certainly the case, but uh, it's not necessarily true that the older child, the more severe the deformity. Um, so yeah, um, I, I, I would say that, it probably is uh, that they are independent factors. And in regard to torsion, uh, that's a very good point that there, have, there is of course torsional deformity in the club foot, particularly this age. Um, and we know that the lateral malleolus is rotated, um, and posterior, and um, so, so to actually to define torsion in the, in the ankle joint as, as compared to the foot is, I think it was quite a difficult thing to do. We didn't look at it um, in our study, uh, but I think uh, your observation there would be very valid. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask one question to you? Please. Can I ask a question, Dr. Nan? Yeah, so uh, uh, this scoring system is applicable to orthorhabitic and other feet also because uh, there might be the difference of uh, rigidness in the tissues. So are you applying the same for the neglected orthorhabitic feet as well, the same system? Um, yeah, so uh, please just confirm your question. Was it about arthrogripotic feet as well and syndromic clubfoot? Yeah. So yeah, we, we, we didn't look at that um in terms of our scoring system we purely were looking at um you know feet that are idiopathic um congenital club feet and we discounted all of those previous cases neuromusculars and um, arthrogripotics and other syndromics um so yeah we i i guess it could be used for that but our, our purpose our purpose was to see if it if it um, if these feet were going to respond to casting or not, and as such, you know, in bringing in other different types of uh, club foot, I think would have made that uh, that assessment difficult because, of course, we know that arthrogropotics are particularly resistant, um, and other types as well. So, um, yeah, I, we just wanted to have uniformity of the type of foot that we most commonly see here in Ethiopia, which is the untreated idiopathic. Um, I, I have one question. Uh, you know, the equinus is the most difficult bit to correct. So was yeah. there any correlation between somebody having high equinus score or high plantar score and them being resistant? Yes, um, I mean, so when we looked at the components of the score, uh, you, you're right. Um, Plantaris and Aquinas are very difficult. And I think, I think probably that does run with age more than other features. Uh, so that um, children who have significant amount of um, Aquinas um, often have a dysmorphic talus and quite quite flattened and uh, that can be that can be a real challenge to uh, to correct so yes i i agree with you um there may well be um uh, sort of 
age age related aspects um, within the scoring system it's another great question thank you for that i hope i've answered it <laughs> thank you um, yeah, team it is excellent uh, presentation i have a question uh, dr itesh speaking uh, did you check the interrater reliability of the specific component of the paver score like i find it the rotation would be a uh, little subjective uh, whether would you find anything in your study we did we did look at that and they were all they were all moderately correlating and uh, reasonably good agreement um i would say probably the the one that was was probably most difficult to to get a, a good agreement was the varus um because uh, the drawing the angles on the foot um was actually quite is quite a challenge because the the heel's short of course um so yeah the 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 way the way we looked at it um i i'd say there was moderate correlation for all of these all of these sub points um and um yeah and and overall uh reasonably good correlation okay and second question what is the youngest age you can do the the paver score two years or even younger than one year yeah no we i i i think i think probably to to differentiate the plantaris from the aquinas deformity does take a larger foot um so that's why we went from two to two to the age of 10 okay so tim can i ask something please anyway that was excellent work you have done a couple of things or uh, did you i mean is there a reason uh, that the ones which correct well are they children who might have some features of laxity elsewhere because we did publish a paper on that but the laxity if you have laxity elsewhere probably the club foot is probably in the old classification of soft on soft soft on rigid rigid and rigid so whether it works as soft or rigid or rigid or soft when you come to syndromes like say ehlers dan loss or arthrogryposis or say uh, uh, dysplasias where you get like diastrophic dwarfism they also possibly you can use the same system but the way we used to operate once upon a time either you got over correction in the lax group which is quite often the case though it's surprising they all get club feet whereas conditions like arthrogryposis which are rigid on rigid they rarely we can get any correction of they have relapses uh, so much that if they get over corrected feet it's iatrogenic so i wonder whether there will be a correlation between hypermobility scores of some sort to mm. your paper possibly in this group well i think uh i think that that's a really good point um just two observations on that so in performing the score you do put on a gentle uh, correcting force onto each to each of the deformities uh -huh. that you're assessing good evening so um i think probably so, so for example in assessing rotation around the tailor head you would perform the ponsetti maneuver essentially by pressing your thumb onto the tailor head and trying to get a um a correction so in a sense that does that does account for some of the uh laxity um that that you do see in that it's a fi what we're trying to assess is fixed deformity um however i i do agree with you i think there would be a there would be some good correlations there uh we know in ethiopia possibly similar to india as well that there's quite a bit of um uh, systemic hyperlaxity in a lot of our patients and we have a large number of patients for example presenting with um um you know ddh and other things which which no doubt is there's that there's there's hypermobility present um so yeah we have tried in our best way possible i think in the scoring system to try and um reduce the effects of laxity um and you know i think i think in a in an older the older the older kids 
um, where they tend to have uh, less in the way of laxity that prevents correction, but perhaps more in the way of bony deformity that co prevents correction. Um, whether or not that would still hold true in the older kids, I'm not sure, but um, I, I think it's a, it's a very good point. But you're right, you are, what you're assessing is the bony deformity, which is what it's finite endpoint. You have to stretch it to an endpoint to measure yeah. all the angles. So I think it's a fair enough measurement in the neglected club foot, no doubt. The same thing is in what we used to see with multiply operated feet in the UK was we don't have, usually they don't even stretch because of the scarring on the medial side. So there's a yeah. big difference between the two groups. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, excellent work. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, is it possible to ask another question, Ashish? Yeah, please, please, please. last question. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to know, have you ever considered x-rays for your feet in your assessment? And if not, why do you think they would be important? Yeah, no, that, that, that's, a good, that's a good point. Um, so x-ray evaluation, I do find useful uh, sometimes, uh, particularly over decision-making once I've tried once I've tried casting, particularly for those that are, are failing uh, casting. Um, however, in the initial assessment and in the initial treatment, I don't tend to use x-ray. Um, and, you know, the, the bone morphology uh, after, after correction of these feet is often very abnormal. Um, and I, I don't tend to find it a useful thing to, to measure in terms of um, uh, these deformities. Uh, cl clearly that would be a large amount of exposure. Um, and I think the, you know, there are some deformities where maybe X-ray would be necessary, such as cavus deformity. Um, you, you probably need a standardized X-ray to measure that. It's very difficult to clinically measure that. Um, so that's why we went to the more clinical um, measure, which was looking at the lateral side of the foot and looking for plantaris, uh, which is the, you know, the, the angle be between the, uh, the calcaneus uh, and the angle of the fifth metatarsal. So I think x-rays are, are useful for, in my practice, uh, but for management purposes, um, much much later on in the treatment process, and when I'm struggling uh, to get a good correction, particularly equinus correction for me, I want to see. Uh, and getting a decent X-ray is very difficult on these patients, and with the bony morphology and rotation and the torsion of the distal tibia, as some, as, as we previously mentioned it's very difficult to get a good lateral of the, of the ankle uh, to assess that flat top. So um, that would be the time in the OR that I would get a fluoroscopic assessment of the talus. Um, I, I will also use x-rays. Um, if, if I'm struggling to get a, a midfoot um, to correct, and usually I would I'll be looking then for a blocking calcaneal cuboid joint, which in these older kids is very oblique. Uh, sometimes that can block uh, the tailor navicular um, for reduction. I hope that's answered your question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. So we'll move on to the next talk by Mohan Beltur on uh, casting and manipulation techniques. Mohan, please. Thanks. Hi, good evening, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so, as you all know, the Pansati method of manipulation and casting is a very specific regimented method, which mainly involves two parts. Um, the first part is called as a casting, uh, manipulation and casting. 
where the physician or the healthcare provider does all the work. And then the second part is called as um, raising, where the parents do most of the work uh, facilitated by the healthcare team. And in between is, uh, uh, in most patients require a tenotomy of the tendo oculus, correct ankle equines. Um, well, why does this technique work? It depends on two things. Um, it depends on um, the kinematics of the subtalar joint, and it also depends on um, the viscoelastic properties of uh, the foot. Uh, these include uh, things like stress relaxation and creep, which is time dependent deformation. So uh, the foot, like the body, composed of water, predominantly about 70%, and that allows uh, us to use the viscoelastic properties to achieve this correction. So as you all know, this, the subtalar joint is formed by the tail is sitting in the acetabulum pedis as shown here. Uh, and this is very important to understand this anatomy uh, as it's, so this is what allows correction of the foot using the Ponsetti method. Um, it also depends on the, um, the axis of the subtalar joint, which is oblique in two planes, both in the frontal plane as shown here, uh, and in the sagittal plane, and therefore this coupling of movements. So whenever you correct, um, whereas forefoot reduction uh, at, at the same time, there is dorsiflexion through the subtalar joint as well. Uh, this is called kinematic coupling, and that's what. Uh, so th this is the property that's used to correct the club foot using the Ponsetti method. Um, another important principle is called as the calcaneo pedis block. Um, as, as you might have not noticed here, um, you know, the whole foot, including the calcaneum, moves under the tail tailors. So you hold the, the, the tailor head where it's marked TH on this model um, with your thumb and the rest of the foot kind of moves under it as shown. So this is another important principle because if you, for any reason, prevent the calcaneus from moving under the tailors, like Hiram Kite did, then you will not get uh, correction of the club foot deformity. So this is one of the important practical applications in this method. Um, also, you know, we need to understand the two extreme positions of the, of the subtalar joint and the foot in general, which is so, uh, supination, which is a combination of, you know, forefoot reduction, hind foot wearers, and an ankle equinus, uh, and termed as supination, and also, recognize that the club foot is an extreme form of uh, supination deformity of the foot as shown here. And what we want to get to is uh, the foot in the pronated position uh, where the fourth foot is abducted, the ankle is dorsiflexed and the hind foot is everted. So the Ponsetti method using the the kinematic coupling of the subtalar joint takes the foot from an extreme supinated position, which is shown on my left, to an, a pronated position, which is on my right, and thereby it corrects hind foot, um, sorry, forefoot reduction, hind foot wearers, and to some extent, subtalar uh, and ankle equinus at the same time. So it's like a so it's like a, a train following uh, a railway track and, and the foot follows the normal kinematics of the subtalar joint. So this is the important principle. So now coming to the position of uh, you know, how we do the manipulation and the casting. So there's a, there's a couple of important positions. So like I said, um, this is a two-handed uh, te uh, manipulation technique where 
you know, one hand rests on the lateral tailor head, the thumb rests on the lateral tailor head, and notice that the other fingers are, are encircling the leg anteriorly, not posteriorly, uh, where you, you may run into a uh, problem of blocking the calcaneus for moving underneath the tailors. And on the other hand, grasps the uh, metatarsals, uh, even all the way up to the, the Tailonavicular joint to prevent any midfoot break. So the entire foot moves with the calcaneus underneath the talus. And this video is going to show that. So the thumb is on the talus. Uh, I would say the thumb should be even further forward where it's marked TH on the lateral tailor head. And um, And this is what you would see how the, you know, the forefoot adduction and hind foot varus are corrected at the same time and showing the, the correction to some extent of the subtalar equinus um, as well. And this shows the correction of the hind foot varus as you move the foot out. Okay. So it's also important to achieve maximum abduction. Ponserti in his initial series um, did not abduct the foot to like 60 degrees um, as he later did in his second paper in 1973. In his first paper in 1963, um, he had abducted to just around 40 degrees, which is the normal degree of abduction of a infant foot. And he noticed that when he abducted it to 60, the risk of it coming back uh, was much smaller uh, because the, the medial structures um, uh, had, were more stretched and, and less, and even if they did recur, didn't come back all the way. So Hiram Kite's mistake, I just want to point this out, was placing the, the hand over the calcaneus where it says no on the left, uh, on, on the bone model where it says no. So, and preventing the calcaneopedal block to move underneath the tail tailors. So, and it took almost 50 years for the orthopedic finger to move from, from the no position to the TH position. Uh, so, well, now, the, now that we understand the principles of how the method works, uh, what is this set, uh, how, how do we do it? Or what's the setup? Um, usually um, what Ponsetti told me was we, we should usually um, keep the child starving. You know, the baby is usually um, fed every two to three hours. So make sure and instruct the parents that um, don't feed the child for about two hours before you do the manipulation because having a child that's at peace and not, uh, you know, thrashing about is very important uh, for us to place a very good cast that doesn't have any wrinkles or ridges that could cause soft tissue issues. So uh, when you feed the child two hours before, and if, so the next feed will be while we are manipulating and casting. So have a bottle ready. Uh, if the mother is bottle feeding, have a bottle ready. If the mother is breastfeeding, sometimes I ask them to train the child bottle feeding. If not, I, I put the child in the mother's lap while the mother is breastfeeding. Obviously, you know, mother should be comfortable with that. And then, uh, you know, we do the, the manipulation and casting. And usually the baby is quiet, distracted. As opposed to if the baby has just had a full stomach, has already fed, and if we go to mess around because they are usually sleeping after they're fed, then you know usually they don't like it. They start crying, thrashing about, makes casting, manipulating difficult. So usually you have the baby at the end of the table like this, as shown. Um, the manipulator or the holder is you know, the attending, if you have a really good casting, if not, if you have somebody that's not as well trained in the casting method, then you might be the caster as well. Um, and then the other person will be holding. Um, and then you usually sit, the manipulator or the holder sits on the side of the, uh, for example, in this case, the right top foot. So the manipulator is sitting on the right side of the baby. The mother is sitting on the left side. 
distracting the child, um, sometimes by playing music or whispering to the child or feeding the child. And then the cast text stands at the end of the table as shown here. Um, what materials we use is also important. Usually, you know, Marco and the end, Pansetti say that, you know, do it, don't do it in a busy cast room where there's multiple castings, you know, cast saw is being used. There's lots of sound. So you do it in a quiet room um, where the child and family uh, with the couple of providers are doing it. So um, the environment is quiet, calm uh, and reassuring. Um, also what we need is, uh, I use uh, Webril cast padding, which is easily, uh, which kind of, uh, which has a good feel to it and it's not constricting. Uh, and, and, and then uh, you can easily apply a very good uh, padding. Um, how we pad is also important. We usually start off with, you know, three rolls right at the end of the foot and then very little padding in the rest of the foot um, up until the knee, where you just one roll of padding overlapping by 50%. And then again, three layers right at the, at the groin uh, so that there is no skin pressure uh, at the edges of the cast. And also it's, it's, it's not like a fracture cast where uh, it's loose to allow for swelling, it's more conforming. I would not use the word constricting, but it's more conforming. So there's very little space for the foot to slip in the cast. That's very important. Um, so those are things that like Mark Wende as well as Ponsetti stressed a lot um, when doing the casting. Um, so th then the other important thing is manipulating before casting as shown is here. This is important again um, to assess how far you can go. Uh, you don't want to, you, you just want to use two finger pressure, not anything more than that. Uh, so, and it's important to manipulate. And then the, you know, the manipulation sequence follows the mnemonic cave. So you correct midfoot cave as first with the first cast because the forefoot is relatively uh, uh, pronated relative to the hind foot. So you need to bring the hind foot, uh, the forefoot and the hind foot to the same degree of supination. That you can do by elevating the, the first ray as shown here on the left um, by this arrow. And then also in the picture here at the top and then supinating, bringing them both into the same degree of supination and then applying the cast in the same position. This was another mistake of kite where it tried to pronate the foot, the forefoot in relation to the hind foot and it locks the midfoot and does not allow further correction. So that's important to note. So the forefoot is pronated, normally is pronated. So you then supinate it as shown here to elevate the first ray. So, and, and, and do not pronate it as shown here. Um, and that's how the cast, the first cast would look. Um, you then move on to A and V, which is uh, forefoot adduction and hind foot wearers. Um, here, using the calcaneopedal block principle we talked about earlier, and maintaining the, the foot in the same degree of supination that you already obtained in the, the first cast. And then you place the, the thumb on the lateral tailor head as shown here. And then the other two fingers underneath the, the forefoot, and then you abduct the foot, uh, correcting both forefoot adduction and hind foot varus at the same time, using the kinematic coupling principle of the subtalar joint. And using a series of casts, um, as shown here, the foot goes in, from my left to my right, the hind foot uh, varus and forefoot adduction are corrected at the same time. And um, to some extent, the subtalar equinus is corrected. And when you, when, when you see that the hind foot varus is completely corrected and the forefoot adduction is corrected, the only remaining thing is the ankle equinus. That's when uh, you know that the, the foot is ready for the tenotomy to correct ankle equinus. Also, you need to achieve maximum abduction by 
abducting the foot about 60 degrees in relation to the thigh. One question the parents ask is this wrinkling. As you notice, as you start correcting this foot, you see this wrinkling that increases over the lateral part of the, uh, the foot around the sinus tarsi area. Uh, the parents are kind of worried about it. So you have to tell them it's just the redundant skin and it takes about six months to a year for that to resolve. And it's not something to worry about. Sometimes there may be some maceration there, but usually it's nothing to worry about. So, so this is how the correction happens. So um, some important points is localizing the talus. Sometimes in, in a stubby foot, it may be difficult to kind of localize the lateral talar head. Um, so what you do is you overcorrect the deformity, uh, which makes the talar head obvious like so. So this is the fibula marked in red and the talar head, lateral talar head is in green. So it's the first structure anterior and um, distal to the fibula. Okay, or to the uh, lateral malleolus in this case. And then where to put the fingers, you put the, the lateral border of the thumb or the radial border of your thumb, of your right hand in this case, um, on the lateral tailor head as shown here. Uh, the rest of the fingers can be, the index finger is behind the fibula, the other fingers are not doing anything, they are not blocking the calcaneus, and the other hand is as shown. This is Pansetti's hand. And here he showed the same thing, molding. It's also important to keep the hand moving, not holding it in one position because doing that causes indentation of the cast and um, can cause uh, skin pressure. Also, what material you use for casting is important. Usually rapid setting gypsona is good. And, um, you may want to use some lukewarm water because if you use cold water, it takes a longer time for it to set. Um, so you can control those things using that. Um, in, the, in the infant foot, you can use a single-handed maneuver sometimes as sh shown here where you can use the thumb of the same hand on the lateral tailor head and the fingers under the, under the forefoot. Uh, you don't have to use a two-handed maneuver. Uh, like so, um, that's called as a one-handed maneuver. Um, and here, Pansetti, you see Pansetti's index finger behind the calcaneus showing um, he's, he's molding it above the calcaneus so that cash doesn't slip. And uh, cash goes all the way to the groin because in, a, in an infant, if you just go up to the below knee, it's, it's likely to slip. So by flexing the knee, you prevent it from slipping and also you get the external rotation uh, force to correct the foot. Um, so um, as you can see, when the foot is abducted to 60 degrees or so, and the hind foot valgus is corrected, forefoot reduction is corrected. Uh, and this is what is shown in the last cast on the right, then you're, you're ready to do the tenotomy. Thank you. I'm ready for questions. Thank you, Mohan. That was very good overview. We have a question from audience. Dr. Manish Prasad from AFMC Pune has a question for you and all the faculty. He's wondering whether we abduct the forefoot by exaggerating the equinus. And is it likely to give us quicker correction as compared to doing abduction in whatever position of equinus it is? Um. I think if you, I don't know, I have not tried it personally, but um, if you put it in, um, so because the abduction and whereas essentially are happening through the subtalar joint. So um, in my mind, I would say creating more equinus, you know, would not change the kinematics of this, how the subtalar joint works. So I don't think um, that would add greatly um, in being able to abduct more or less, in my opinion. Thank you for the question. Okay, anyone else? James, Alaric? Yeah, uh, may I say something about it? Yes. I think uh, when you do the first part of the cavus correction, there will be a uh, force which will also stretch 
uh, or correct part of the equinus, which you can't help it. It has to happen. If you look at normal foot and ankle movements, it's not only about subtalar. Pronation also occurs at the, you can't pronate your foot in plantar flexion and supination. You understand? So it, all, it happens at the ankle as well. It's a combination movement between ankle and subtalar in normal kinematics. Uh, supination and pronation, a combination of midfoot, subtalar, or the triple joint uh, to the astablum pedis and the ankle. That is one. Two, the more equinus you keep the foot, the higher the chances that plaster is going to slip. There are enough of kids who are wrigglers, and when their thigh segment is like conical, they usually tend to slip. And uh, you can't hyperflex too much to prevent it. So I think for those two reasons, probably Ponseti may not have uh, put them in, in further equinus. I think that's what I would think. Okay. I Thanks. hope it makes sense. I don't know. Alaric, any comments? No, I quite agree with what uh, the previous two speakers have said. They have answered that perfectly correct. Thank you. Thanks. Um, any more questions? Any comments? Okay, so we move on yeah. to the uh, next. Ashish, can I ask yeah, one sir. question? Yeah, yeah sure. Mohan, it was an excellent presentation. Uh, I have a question for the Mohan. The uh, what is because there is no clear cut guideline for the manipulation of foot uh, before casting, and that is really subjective because I know that in UK and many many developing world, the physiotherapists were involved in the manipulation before they push the cast. Even in Israel. They put for the 15 minutes to 20 minutes for the manipulation before casting. And it's quite subjective. So what is your protocol for manipulation before putting cast? Yeah, I mean, it serves two purposes. The first purpose is you will get a sense of how much you can push that foot so that um, you don't, um, you know, unnecessarily stress the soft tissues and create uh, um, like any damage to the soft tissues. Um, second thing is, um, in addition to pushing it, you also are distracting. Like I said, with your fingers, you go all the way to the telonavicular joint. And then while you're manipulating, you also distract. Uh, you put a little bit of traction and that allows, um, that prevents crushing of the, you know, the tailors. Um, as you bring the navicular around the talus, um, so and the calcaneal block, so those are two things that Panzetti and Mark when they stress. And usually the duration I do that is just for about a minute or so, um, not more than that usually. Um, so I hope I answered your question. Yeah, I agree with that. The, there is no doubt about the benefits of the manipulation because I also do manipulate. But whether it is the uniform throughout the world, Dr. James? Uh, very interesting you say that. Uh, what, about 20, 21 years ago? Of course, I've nev I never went to Iowa, though I sent a plaster technician to visit Ponseti. But when I first did the course, the teaching was 90 seconds of manipulation at every yeah. time. Uh, irrespective. So now whether uh, 90 or 60 or 120 makes a difference, I'm not too sure. The question is, uh, you're right. I don't know. You, you may be right that the physiotherapist may be doing it for a longer time. If you look at the French technique, they, of course, do a little longer. Than, I think they almost do 15 to 20 minutes and then they put their CPM and so on. So if you look at the French method, which goes on a totally different philosophy, and possibly they too have got reasonable results, but it's not practical for many a country to follow their method. Uh, so yes, I think, you know, the other thing, which maybe if I have to put a little span in the works is, is it the fast uh, five week, uh, instead of one week, doing a fast track protocol every five days, does it make a difference is the question. Why in the UK we follow every week is because that's how our clinics are set up. Our clinics are in such a way that it falls every other week, like mine was always on a Wednesday or Monday. 
So we don't want to swap, uh, you know, things. So I do not know is the question. But I think, I suppose 90 seconds is what I was taught many, many years ago. And I, uh, of course, I, uh, my colleagues now do the Ponsetti for the standard ones. I do for all the other, uh, whatever uh, syndromic stuff come to me. But yes, uh, it's a good question though, yeah. yeah. What is the practice and, in Alaric? Yeah, yeah, Mohan, yeah. Continue on, sorry. No, I just wanted to add that um, Mark Wende has a paper published on the rapid technique where, you know, for patients coming out of town, or out of country, they, you know, they keep them there in Iowa and try to finish it in about three weeks or less, where they do the cast every three days. So they, I think the fastest they have gone is about three days with the casting changes. And then uh, the longest is about two weeks in the older children. If I may uh, say something there, I think a lot of what we talk of the Ponsetti method is uh, a large amount of art and some amount of science. There's a lot of aspects of the Ponsetti method which uh, are difficult to prove at times and maybe we never may never have those answers to them. Um, I think really we're not really watching that clock to see whether we are manipulating that foot for 30 seconds or a minute or you know two minutes as such. I don't think Ponsetti ever stressed about that. All he said was manipulate the foot enough to uh, take up that crimp which is there in the in the collagen, in the ligaments and in the tendon, and then um, you do it enough till you till you find what position the foot comes into now, and then cast the foot in that position, and then at a subsequent uh, cast change, whether that's a five weeks or seven uh, five days or seven days, you then move it a little more. So every time you get that little more correction, so. Yes, I agree. As James said, you know, I visited the French uh, method and I saw how they were doing it. And that's an extremely elaborate method of where the physiotherapists invest almost uh, 20 to 25 to 30 minutes in manipulating the foot because they believe the functional approach to the correction and then sort of tie those feet up in skis or tape them with skis and make those children, if they're the older ones, to actually walk around in the clinic for some time. Uh, and they never use cast uh, at that point, you know. So... Uh, there are two different philosophies, and I think if you follow the Ponsetti philosophy, those few seconds of uh, manipulation to get the desired position and then cast it in that particular position is what's recommended. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. So if there are no questions, uh, we will move on to the next presentation by Tim regarding management of neglected club. Thank you. So this is uh, returning back to an older child. And I, I just hope I'll be able to uh, give you an insight into um, our journey in trying to uh, discover and get evidence for uh, treatment of these older children with club feet. So our goal is to uh, try and develop an evidence-based algorithm uh, for these children in Ethiopia. So this was our, our go-to a uh, number of years ago. Um, so a posterior medial um, release, extensive deep surgery, um, and e even in older children like this. I just got a follow-up video of one such child here. And I think you can appreciate that they're having tr difficulty in balancing. There's a wide gait. And clearly in, a in feet like these, there's, there's stiffness, there's deep scarring from the previous surgery. Now presenting as a very significant challenge. Probably they'll never end up with a supple foot. And just looking at the data from, from that era of doing PMRs, um, it's a 40, 46 feet, and we had 90% of persisting or recurrent deformity. And almost all of these children will be non-compliant with brace treatment. And so we decided moving forward, uh, we would not rely on brace treatment uh, to hold a deformity correction. We had a number of overcorrections as well. Uh, three of these feet had the classic uh, overcorrection 
uh, features of dorsal bunion, etc. Um, one of the feet actually was um, very nearly amputated as we lost a considerable amount of soft tissue. The question came to me is, is a partially corrected or a current club foot following treatment worse than an untreated foot? I just want to share these, uh, these pictures here. It's a boy um, whose right foot um, has had treatment and you can see that he's weight bearing on the lateral edge. So decided to put uh, him through a bit of paragraph and you can see here, this is the uh, a more normal foot, right foot. You can see the pressures are low. There's heel strike and toe off. This is his pre-treatment club foot. And you can see there are high pressures and uh, the toes are barely touching the floor. And now you can see here, uh, this is post-treatment with him in that supinated position where he's overloading the lateral ray. In fact, peak pressures are much higher uh, than they were even before we started treatment. So I think the answer is definitely yes. Uh, and under correction, uh, can leave the patient worse off, even though they've got a smile on their face because their toes are pointing the right direction, uh, children would be in significant pain in an undercorrected position. So our treatment protocol changed in 2014. And um, here we have some data from the first 100 cases. Uh, and instead of a 90% failure rate, we almost had an, a 90% success rate. Um, and we're now looking at this, the same patient group five years out. Um, most, most of the, the patients had a maximum of nine outpatient casts. And um, after that, we discontinued as, and classified them as having failed casting. Um, they were then admitted for equinus correction. Um, obviously, these are, these are much older children. You couldn't do that easily in clinic. Um, and so an equinus correction would be a percutaneous Achilles tendon lengthening um, and then a tibialis anterior tendon transfer once we'd achieved our goal of 15 degrees dorsiflexion. There was no need for any daytime ankle foot orthosis and um, those that were cast resistant after nine casts underwent invasive surgery. So here we have a six-year-old boy uh, idiopathic delay presenting club foot. Um, he's undergoing the manipulation and casting. And typically, following on from the discussion just before, the manipulation period is much longer. And we would aim to go for a five minute manipulation at an absolute minimum. And uh, particularly uh, trying to see if we can reduce things like pressure points. Uh, that would create um, necrotic skin and other problems. So our casting protocol would be to go for cavus correcting casts until the cavus is fully corrected. This often means the cavus correcting casts, we may need three, four or five of them um, until that is properly corrected. Uh, that deformity is particularly difficult to correct. Um, and we've just been using casting for that. We haven't been doing uh, plantar fascia releases or anything else like that. Uh, all our casts are long leg. Uh, this doesn't mean they go to the groin though. Um, so, so long as they get as far as the mid thigh, we think that's okay. Uh, that seems to control rotation enough. Um, again, a pressure point awareness, the knee is at 45. There is a problem with long-term casting and knee stiffness. So we reduced our, our knee flexion from 90, which we use for infants, to 45 degrees in these older children. And then the assessment of the foot is out of cast. Um, what you think you see on the cast and when the cast is removed may be different things. Our criteria for surgery, this is the equinus correction surgery, is a sunken talus, a heel that's into valgus position and a midfoot that's at least at neutral. 
So this is after six casts and uh, this child requires more. And after eight casts, they were then ready for a percutaneous Achilles tendon lengthening, then a tibialis anterior tendon transfer combined with an abductor halysis um, release um, once the um, once the full 15 degrees of dorsiflexion had been reached. So this is the lad post-op. So click, yeah, classically, they would need to go undergo a fair bit of rehabilitation. Um, and this is at one year following surgery. Here's a, a second case. Uh, the left side is obviously much uh, more affected and a slightly older child. And again, um, his, his post-op, um, in this case, he's, he's running around. Um, just to show you, he's, he's, um, he's painless and uh, plantigrade. And what we tend to find out with these kids is that they, they do tend to have weakness in uh, the calf muscles. Uh, so going up onto tiptoes sometimes can be difficult. Uh, this guy, I think, can manage that just about. Certainly going up onto tiptoes on one foot is uh, usually very difficult. Um, but as, as with all club feet, it's the ankle, quality of the ankle, which is important, and dorsiflexion, um, which, which gives him such good function. So the limited surgery, which is for Aquinas correction, is a usually a percutaneous Achilles tendon lengthening involving a, a three-step procedure, such as the Hoke procedure. And uh, for those uh, under the age of five, perhaps a simple tenotomy is all that's needed. Uh, we, we don't do ankle capsulotomies anymore. Um, we will perform a cast wedge or further casting um, following this because that that will enable us to further stretch the posterior ankle structures such as the uh, joint capsule and then the, the, the tibialis anterior tendon transfer is performed um, in the vast majority of patients and uh, this we think of uh, the concept of it being like a biological brace and is taken to the lateral cuneiform uh, under full tension uh, secured by zero vicryl over a button. So uh, this is a, just a short uh, series of photos showing our cast wedge procedure. So we've done the Achilles tendon release and now we're going to take out a wedge of cast um, and then uh, apply uh, further, uh, further plaster of Paris. It's quite a controlled way of correcting further Aquinas and checking the toes for, uh, for perfusion afterwards, obviously. Um, so of those that are not corrected under the age of 10, I would say these were somewhat more unusual cases in our setting. Uh, we need to check whether the percutaneous Achilles tendon lengthening was indeed complete. And uh, as I mentioned before, um, getting a nice um, cross table lateral x-ray to look at the talus morphology, I think is important. Uh, re rehab um, is, uh, is certainly important. I just want to uh, draw, draw to your attention a few things here. Check out the um, hyperextension at the knee joint in this uh, kid that's never been treated. Um, have a look at the that the pelvis, which is thrown forward in flexion, and that's causing a lumbar lordosis and, and a protrusion of the belly. So what we tend to find with these kids is there's weakness, it's, and it's not just in the, not just in the uh, below the knee. There certainly is weakness below the knee, but, but it extends above the knee. Um, some of these uh, core muscles are very weak indeed. Uh, abdominal muscles are very weak indeed. Um, the hamstrings are often um, functionally long, and certainly we've seen that in our gait analysis of these patients. Um, so exercise classing, classes, 
during and after um, we consider to be an important part of rehabilitation and will help these kids to get, get on the road to recovery faster. So the questions that need answering from this is how does casting work in the older child? Is it, is it just through ligament, um, tendon stretching, soft tissue, or is there cartilage plasticity going on? And if so, does that affect the duration and the, the timing of the changing of casts? And I think an MRI study is needed to determine this. Secondly, it raises a question of what, what is the best outcome measurement tool for these children? Is it a patient related outcome measure or is it an observational functional performance score? And thirdly, uh, what to do with those that fail casting? So just to talk about that for a brief moment, we do see cast resistance um, and the common bony deformities that cause that are the classic flat top talus, um, obliquity of the calcaneal cuboid joint, and sometimes the cuboid does resemble more of a triboid than a cuboid. And you can see the, the sort of like the thumb finger process of the calcaneum probably is never going to reduce um, in these cases. And thirdly, and has been previously mentioned, the navicular is somewhat wedge shaped. And so the further correction you get, the, the more difficult it is. So we looked at 55 feet that failed casting up to the age of 14 years and randomly allo allocated them to either a soft tissue distraction procedure, as you can see top right, and that was followed by a tibialis anterior tendon transfer, or a stage triple arthrodesis, as you can see uh, being performed on the bottom right. The outcome measures we used were the uh, Laveg and Ponsetti outcome score. And uh, we looked at which, uh, which of these treatment arms required additional surgical interventions as well. So in terms of the recurrence, we had uh, nine patients in the triple arthrodesis group that required additional procedures. Uh, some of those were additional frames, uh, some of them were additional uh, triple arthrodesis, um, other, other, other things as well, some midfoot osteotomies. And that's to compare against one patient, one foot, in the um, soft tissue distraction group using the Elizaroff um, apparatus. And you can see on the right here, the outcome measures and uh, scores uh, using the Lavag and Ponsetti outcome measure for the two groups. And there's a significant and obvious uh, benefit in the Elizaroff soft tissue distraction group. And this actually, if, when we looked at sub, subgroup analysis, it was even more so in the younger age group. Uh, so those around the age of eight or nine, Elizaroff soft tissue distraction patients did very well. Um, and moderately well in the uh, in 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 the uh, older older group as well, but um, the triple arthrodesis patients had a widespread, but uh, generally they didn't function as well on the scoring. Here you can see this uh, right foot. You can just say, tell that uh, he's trying to stand up, and I've got my fingers underneath his heel, and getting the Aquinas correction. Uh, even after significant amount of casting and attempts, um, getting Aquinas correction with a triple arthrodesis is very challenging. Often you're pushing and you, what you create is a midfoot, um, essentially a midfoot break. And uh, you have a, a, you know, the, the most anterior part of the calcaneum is prominent in the sole of the foot, which is very unsatisfactory. So in the mature feet, uh, so uh, girls over the age of 12, boys over the age of 14, um, neglected club foot um, becomes a very, very difficult, um, difficult prospect. And some of these feet are very challenging. Uh, our, our protocol has um, been either to leave them alone. And, and clearly, if, if a child is not in any pain and an adolescent is not in any pain and he, he wants to do a physical job, uh, that 
may in fact be the right way to go. Uh, for many, they, they are come to our services asking for correction. And if the deformity is, is mild, we would uh, consider a triple arthrodesis. Possibly if the, if the uh, calcaneum is high riding, we would do that in stages and do a first stage soft tissue release and then a triple arthrodesis. Um, I have tried doing V and Y osteotomies on these types of patients um, and correction is achieved, uh, but that is a very, very long duration of, co of correction. And in my experience is that um, in treating like two or three of these cases uh, with this uh, type of treatment, it's, it's very painful and patients uh, uh, really, really are suffering to, you can imagine the amount of distraction that's occurring on the medial side of this, this foot if uh, you're going to just do osteotomies and correction. Uh, so lastly, we've been looking at doing triple arthrodesis and combining that with a frame. So essentially to do modest cuts for a triple arthrodesis, um, applying an, an Elizarov fixator frame and then getting a correction of the residual deformity uh, in a slow fashion, uh, which seems to be better for soft tissues. Um, and classically, we push those into a slightly overcorrected position. Um, leave them for a while before removal of the frame. Um, and uh, gratifyingly, we've, we've had better results with the adolescents with uh, clubfoot with this technique. Thank you for listening. Thank you. That was excellent. We have a few questions from the audience. Dr. Jasbir uh, Singh from Himachal Pradesh has asked for rigid idiopathic club foot with severe equinus. Is there any role of early tenotomy? So what are the recommendations of the faculty? For he's specifically asking about idiopathic club feet. Um, I'm sorry, just to restate the question, was the question about the tenotomy? Uh -huh. In idiopathic severe club feet with equinus. Uh, yes. Um, so I think, I think I, yeah, I think the, the answer is, yeah, we, we do tend to do, we do do uh, tenotomies, Achilles tenotomies for all of these kids. Um, if they undergo a triple arthrodesis, we do it. If they're undergoing uh, a Lizarov soft tissue distraction, we do it. If we, yeah, so all, all of them have an Achilles tenotomy. Um, the, um, the tenotomy uh, versus I think is the, maybe the question was tenotomy versus lengthening. Is, would that be fair? So um, tenotomy for fives and under and lengthening uh, for, for over fives is my preference. Although I, I, do, uh, I do understand that there are a, a number of studies now coming out to show that tenotomy in the older age group is, 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 is effective as well. I had some questions, Tim. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, this is Mohan Peltor. Uh, one was, what, what do you mean by a sunken tail? Like tailors, can you explain what you mean by that, please? Yeah, I, I, I'll try. So um, obviously these deformities are assessed at every time that uh, the cast is removed. And um, you, you feel that the prominent tailor head uh, laterally and then uh, within a cast or two it's no longer there and that's what I would call a sunken tailor head um, now I, I think I think uh, that that could be somewhat subjective um, and I think that uh, the casting practitioners uh, they they usually they usually come and tell me when they've uh, they've noticed that it's it's no longer prominent, and the patient is then ready. Um, of those cases where the tailor head 
is still prominent, I will sometimes get an X-ray of those in a stress position in, under fluoro um, to check because the uh, navicular morphology sometimes and the talus morphology sometimes is quite abnormal. And what you think that when you think that the talus head has not has not gone in, in fact, when you actually look at it carefully under under image, um, it 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 indeed has. Uh, and it looks very satisfactory. So, um, yeah. Um, however, so 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 for those cases that fail casting, I would tend to X-ray to look for that. Thank you. So Another question was about your stretch uh, stretch casting, where you wedge the cast. Yes. How many weeks after your 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 tendon Achilles lengthening? With the hook method you start in the older child yeah so uh, for the cast wedge i'd do that four to five days afterwards i noticed that um less than that it, it it's not enough time um more than that um i don't believe there's any there's any point in waiting around so i i tend to go with something like a four to five day interval between the tenotomy or lengthening procedure percutaneous lengthening procedure of the achilles and a cast wedge. Um, if you were to do it uh, with serial casting, I think probably weekly cast would be, would be very satisfactory. Thank you. And then one more question. Can the Ponsetti method be used after the age of 10 years for neglected club feet? Because I think some of some of us and other people I've heard um, have used um, it even up to the age of 40. And sometimes it could work. Yeah. Uh, so in, in my group, I was looking at, again, idiopathic um, delay presenting club foot uh, rather than, say, neuromuscular or, or you know, neurological spastic feet. Uh, so I would say definitely yes. Um, and of course, you will get cases that will fully respond. And I think I think all patients should have a trial of um, Ponsetti manipulation and casting. Um, but I think the expectation is that the vast majority of them will not respond. Um, and that is due to, um, you know, it, it being more of a bony foot uh, rather than a cartilage foot um, in, in, these, in these adolescents. Thank you. We have a question from audience that would you do tenotomy after the second cast, then continue with casting and then repeat that. Yeah, so I know that there was a, a paper uh, published from India that did exactly that. Um, so an early, uh, early soft tissue releases and then casting. Uh, personally, I have been trying to follow the Ponsetti principles of getting the cavus corrected first. Um, and then rotation around the tailor head and then the equinus um, in, in that sequence. And uh, it, seems, it seems to work for my population here in Ethiopia. Thank you. Uh, Alaric, any comments, anything you want to add? So I'd just like to amplify some of the things that uh, Tim has uh, elucidated so well with his talk. Uh, I think a couple of comments first is that we tend not to use the term neglected now because that has a bit of a negative connotation and it's a little disrespectful. You know, when you say neglect, does it come because the parent, does it become, uh, is it because of society? So I think the better term is what Tim Nunn alludes to and says, you know, late presenting club foot or delayed presenting club foot, I think is more appropriate rather than using the term neglect. And that's one thing that probably should move off from a lexicon. Uh, the second thing I would say is uh, rather than using the term Ponsetti method for the older child or for the late presenting club foot, it'd be best to say manipulation and casting using Ponsetti principles because there are some deviations from what Ponsetti originally described for the younger child. So just a few uh, sort of changes in terminology is what uh, I would tend to use. Uh, I agree with, uh, with many of the points that Tim brought up with his presentation. There are some little uh, deviations that we follow in India where we have a significant number of these older children or late presenting feet as well. 
अच्छा सारे कम ऑफ दोस डिस्टेंसेस इट्स व्हिच इज टू इज दैट ओके आशीष प्लीज यस सो सो वन इज दैट आई थिंक वी हैव अ लिटिल हायर थ्रेशोल्ड फॉर द नंबर ऑफ कार्स Uh, I think Jim put the number saying uh, nine cars, whereas you know we have the times gone up to even fifteen or seventeen clusters. And what we use is that if we see the foot is correcting with every cluster change, we are quite open to using uh, cars which even go beyond ten uh, or so. And the uh, the clinical test that we tend to use, uh, which are the children who will sort of benefit or like to fail from uh, the Ponteri principles. I think I would point everyone to this very minor paper that was published by Norgro Penny in 1995, which was titled "The Neglected Subfoot." And in that, he talks of these two types of these older children, and I found that to be very useful in clinical practice. Not many people have highlighted that point later on, but we are looking in terms of that. You know, you have, uh, and that irrespective of age, you find there are two types of feet of uh, these older children. One in which the child walks on the lateral border of the foot. Where the plant size of the cavus is not very much, and these are the feet that look bad when the child stands. But when you put the child supine or non weight bearing, you find that the foot actually is quite flexible, and these are the feet which tend to correct quite well as they score higher, uh, sorry, score lower on the favor score, and tend to respond quite well to the Ponteri principles. Whereas those, the group of children who have really rigid cavus and plant size, and who almost walk on the dorsum of the foot on the talus. And for lack of any better terminology, I would say you know like it's called a penny one and a penny two, and the ones who have the penny two, which are far more rigid, who tend to walk on the dorsal of the foot, are the ones who are more likely to fail the Ponteri principle and need uh, more extensive surgery. So we have used that for lack of any better terminology uh, as a prognostic indicator of which are the children who are likely to benefit using the Ponteri principle. The other points that Tim has brought about flexing the knee to, to 45 degrees, I we agree with. We are a little more. Uh, uh, we tend to use the plantar fasciotis for cavus correction in these penny type two feet, where we have a very rigid cavus and plantaris. We feel casting them sometimes wastes a whole lot of time, and if within a couple of classes we're not able to uh, open up that cavus and plantaris. We don't hesitate doing a, a, a percutaneous plantar fascia release. We find that really helps to save a couple of plasters uh, rather than wasting our time working on the cavus correction, which is worked in a really short lever arm at times and is very difficult to correct in these type two feet. The third difference is that we use percutaneous tenotomy uh, routinely in all children up to the age of ten, and we have even gone to children who are older. We have there's lack of scientific evidence to know what really happens with these feet, and we have now begun a prospective study to do an ultrasound of these children, where we are doing a percutaneous tenotomy to see the healing sequentially over time, and match that the clinical findings of toe raising and toe walking to find out whether there are any deleterious effects of uh, a complete sectioning of the tendon Achilles even in children who are much older. Clinically, we have found that does not happen, but we have never proven that. So I think that's an important study, and if anyone likes to collaborate on that, that would be wonderful to actually prove that you can extend your indication for a complete tenotomy to a much older age, because we found that the minute you take an incision over the tendon Achilles, and if you violate the joints, you're likely to have more stiffness than anything else. So with this tenotomy in the older child, we find that it's impossible to get the 15 degrees of dorsiflexion that we desire using positive principles. And almost all of these children will need uh, either the cast wedging, what Tim Nunn does, whereas we prefer to do sequential or serial casting for two or three uh, uh, sessions uh, every week. And we find that this extended casting helps us to get that dorsiflexion of at least 15 degrees. I don't think we can achieve more than that. In these older children, uh, I think that's a reasonable uh, outcome to get a, a plantigrade foot going up to about 15 degrees of dorsiflexion, which will allow you to clear your foot during the swing phase. So those are the few other differences uh, in our practice compared to what uh, Tim highlighted. Thank you. Yeah, can I just respond briefly to that? Um, just the um, I think we're talking about the same thing with the penny type two. Um, so I I would actually Have um, uh, called them atypical club feet, and I agree with you that that they require a different strategy, um, and certainly the 
the the uh, those plantar fascia those plantar fascias are very tight, and uh, with, with the profound uh, cavus and profound uh, plantaris, um, I'm sure that that that's the right way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm sure we'll have more questions, but because of lack of time, we move on to some cases and I request Hitesh to proceed with the case discussion. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ashish. Uh, I think we'll move on the first case directly. I'll ask Viraj to present his case first. Viraj, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Can I are you able to see my screen? No. Not yet. Ashok? No. Yeah, I clicked on the share, but I'm not able to still. Um, Ashok? Yeah, click on the share button, sir. Yeah, I clicked on it. Window opens. You can find your presentation there. Yeah. You click on the presentation, click share. Now come back to the Zoom panel, sir. Yeah. Click on the green share screen tab. What are I clicking? There is a window opening. Once you click the green yeah. tab, what happens? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we can see that now. Yeah. Sorry for that uh, delay due to technical difficulties. So, uh, um, I think uh, 10 minutes has been given to me, Ashish. Yeah. Yeah, please go. yeah, so there are a couple of interesting cases I would like to just, uh, uh, as we discussed in the last talk by Dr. Team, that this is now an eight year male child who has uh, uh, delayed presenting uh, idiopathic club foot or what uh, you can call as a neglected uh, club foot. And uh, he wants to go uh, a single stage treatment because many of these children, uh, we uh, select them in camps and then they come for the treatment and they are not affording to stay longer and they are not uh, uh, willing for repetitive casting. So uh, team, uh, Dr. Team, what would be your approach uh, in this, this case? Eight year child, idiopathic club foot, want a single stage treatment. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, did I hear you right that he, he wanted a single stage treatment? Yeah, a single stage. He don't want to go ahead for the multiple casting. And then he want yeah. a foot treated because there are a lot of issues, social issues which are involved. I, so, I think the other I think the um, the other panel members uh, would be best to comment because uh, for, for me the okay. uh, the posterior the posterior medial um, releases and other things uh, the, okay. the outcomes are so poor that I wouldn't offer that. Uh, so I, I, would, I would highly recommend that he he goes away and find someone who can uh, stay with him uh, and yeah. sort out social issues. <laughs> okay. What about James, Dr. James? Uh, I mean, I do come to India and do some work in uh, St. John's, Bangalore. These are all difficult situations. There is no right or wrong answer. I mean, patients' expectations are different. And they might, for social reasons, want. So mm -hmm. When I come, we actually, you know, I don't know, sometimes is it because they can't afford the treatment or is it because... Most other times. Okay, so... Yeah. I mean, but suppose this is, patient is affording, Dr. James, suppose the patient is affording then he and doesn't. he want to go for a single stage treatment, what you would offer? Then I would refuse to say that <laughs> from my experience, uh, unfortunately, the results are not uh, good. And if they can yeah. afford, then they should be able to understand, I think. I think that's what I would do. Yeah. 
Okay. What about Dr. Mohan? What is uh, what will be your approach from US? So now we have heard from Ethiopia and UK. I would spend more time with the family trying to educate them and understand why they are refusing the treatment because sometimes getting into the nitty gritty of why what, what is why do they want first stage treatment and telling them also about the long term results that a short term treatment one stage treatment though may look attractive and less investment of time at this point but does not provide good long term results so would they want a foot would they want their child to have a foot which works his whole life or which works only for 2 to 3 years of his life i think if you ask those questions to them and involve them and provide them enough information i think they will come around so i what, think that what will be the right suppose thing they agree do. with you mohan suppose they agree with you then what will be your uh, treatment in this child 8 year child yeah i, I would do pancity casting same thing like what tim discussed okay so uh, from that we'll come to our own colleagues from india uh, atul any any different opinion you have from mohan or you would like to do some surgery atul is there yes uh, viraj uh, can you can you hear me yeah yeah so yes yes we uh, you know go with the lines of uh, counseling them first and uh, try and create as much deformity uh, using the uh, pancity principles as already alluded to and mm -hmm. uh, do less uh, surgery if i can I can I can understand the dilemma because many of the children they want uh, single shot surgery I, I, and I have done that in the in my in my practice as well when they come uh, you know I've gone ahead and straight away done a surgery I've done in fact uh, since then they release with bony osteotomies and they tend to look good they get corrected very well uh, you know they 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 get stiff as well but you get a plantar get foot so I can I can take a dilemma because you know coming from the same background. uh we face this often where uh, despite counseling uh, you know they would go to somebody else who would then uh, do a, do an incorrect surgery or put a or put a fixator without any knowledge and then you know the and i've seen these feet coming back with problems with recurrence and uh, a more difficult challenging issue so if they come to me you know if despite my counseling uh, if they are not going to really um, uh, you know stay longer then i would i would not hesitate doing a surgery to be honest Any different opinion, Hitesh? Hitesh from Manipal. Now we'll move to different part of India now. Yeah, Hitesh? actually, yeah, yeah. I can. Can you hear? Yeah. Yeah, I agree with the, all the panelists that uh, we need to spend the time with the family for the advantage of the manipulation and casting. And at least manipulation will not correct completely, but it will. before it will decrease the severity of the deformity and once patient will be convinced what i generally do in my practice let us try for two and once they see it's getting corrected they will get convinced very well yeah from pune ranjit ranjit would you have the same approach as hitesh has described yes i even i would consider casting initially because it tends to reduce the number of surgeries that you need to do later right okay any difference ashish ashish i i i agree i agree with the rest i will try to discuss with them okay so uh, our approach is same that uh, for those i am talking about uh, demiglio uh, two uh, one or two deformities or the flexible uh, variety we still go ahead with the pancity uh, uh, correction casting and then uh, mini invasive uh, procedure but for those who are rigid uh, we go ahead for the uh, we just briefly go a little faster so because we do get a lot of this kind of neglected or the delayed presentation or the recurrent feet where uh, people are operated and two three or maybe four surgeries has been performed and our constant are we have most of them they come from the low social economic background limited resources long term hospital which is not possible and they want a single stage procedure i'm talking about the rigid variety i'm talking about the three and grade three or four cases so this is a kind of a middle path we have devised where we do the uh, plantar fasciotomy for the correction of the cavus rather than asking to come for the and four or five casting required for the correction of the cavus we do the uh, so everything is done at the same stage we do the plantar fasciotomy to correct the cavus and then the percutaneous endoachille stenotomy which will correct the equinus and to great extent varus as well and then we do the single stage dorsolateral closure osteotomy right 
now this uh, is a this is a picture how we do the this is the uh, teen atomy is complete teen atomy with uh, i mean we have operated even till 40 years of the age what uh, arjit was discussing and we in fact it the tendon regenerate very well plantar fascia atomy and then the dorsal edge osteotomy where we just take the elliptical incision and we take out the wedge from the uh, the cuboid the lateral medial and intermediate cuneiform and uh, depending upon the severity we might ex ex expand or extend this uh, osteotomy uh, to uh, the further bones then we take out the wedge and then close the osteotomy side it just like we are closing the open book and when we stabilize the forefoot to the hind foot with the help of the kys like this and we use a graft which has been uh, removed from the wedge the same type so that we should not have any kind of non union and then uh, we put the drain which has been removed and water hematoma which is there on the third day uh, in the form of window which is there and then patient is discharged on the fourth day and is called as six week we took out the wires and is then they have to use a, a simple um, afo and then uh, the special consideration where if equinus if you find on table is not correctable particularly the orthoarthritic fit like that or syndromic fit where we might extend a, a incision the posterior incision to some extent and we correct, we uh, 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 actually release the capsule from the same incision and that gives the outcome we extensively studied this procedure morphological functional and radiological evaluation and we found that it was effective useful in relapse as well as a neglected tectal foot so this is a gate you can see the pre and the post of now the beauty of this procedure is we are not touching the talus you know as as compared to the triple orthodontics we are preserving the uh, talus and the subtalar joint uh, so and because of the add you can see the mobility the the foot is very good it is mobile right so we have the hopping and then this is a, you can see the squatting and dorsal flexion and we have very long term follow up of these cases so this is another example of uh, recurrent deformity where this child is a 9 year old he has been operated four times elsewhere and as the doctor team was mentioning they have a secondary effect as at the knee and all other areas uh, so they have and this with the same procedure this is a four year follow up and this is a nine year follow up most of the children we have a follow up of almost till maturity many of them so this is not a normal fit I, i will not say but this is quite a plantigrade fit this is another example of the same technique this child has come from nigeria he, he has undergone almost six surgeries in the past including the posterior medial release laser and all and the very very rigid and stiff fit so these are the cases where we need to extend a, we can extend our wedge to little more area sometimes if very rarely required we can extend up to the metatarsal as well and this is a correction we got for the first feet and then subsequently came for the other feet just like that we extended this our indication to the neurogenic foot as well as where we can from the same osteotomy side we can take out the necrotic bone and then uh, this is a five year and seven year follow up of many of this patient and even we have more more than follow up uh, for this the comment about the a, a, a case which was alaric was discussing you know when uh, when we started with the uh, extended ponsetti indication i was talking about uh, i am talking about 2004 or 2005 where there was a lot of boom about the extended ponsetti for this is a 3 year child who was walking with almost on the dorsum of the foot if you see how she is walking she is walking completely on the dorsum that is what alaric was telling so we could get the initial correction you know we we got a, a correction by severe plasters and tenotomy and this was a correction what we got in spite of good splintage protocol and uh, uh, then the follow up as the, she started getting recurrences and then uh, subsequently deformities increase for the one feet we had to go ahead for the uh, rotational osteotomy as well in addition to the dorsal cage osteotomy of the foot and this is for the other feet also we operated and this is a correction and this is a 3 year follow up of the same girl and then subsequently we kept her under follow up you can see the plantigrade foot with the, it's it's basically the good mobile foot the the mobility of it is a five year follow up of the same girl and this is 12 year follow up so most of the children we have our long term follow up of uh, 
12 years 14 and 15 years many of them without none of the child has uh, any kind of arthritis and see the functional aspect of that so it is a beauty of this uh, so i personally feel that we should not uh, i mean uh, stick to some fixed protocol or like that but we should consider the different options which should which are available so it is very i mean less expensive i will not say as compared to elizor and other uh, methods which are there not any kind of any have a neurovascular problem we had no moon uh, moon problems because we are not touching on the medial aspect and rather by taking out the wedge we are uh, preventing the tension of the medial aspect uh, uh we i agree that there is there is some chance of shortening of it maybe but even if you see the long term follow of the positive series there is a shortening of two to two to three centimeter in most of the series so in summary uh, i think this is one of the good procedure where can we can consider you know for the most of the cases particularly in our indian scenario where they come and they ask for the single uh, time uh, procedure again i am saying i am a strong follower of ponsetti and i do use ponsetti for most of the cases but these are the situations where we we should consider the dorsal closure osteotomy it, it is is one of the beautiful thing to to work over to uh, hitesh any comment hitesh and all faculty which are there thank you viraj for your good follow up good correction and maintenance of the correction in follow up uh, i'll ask uh, dr james what will you do for the older case actually in your protocol in your do you see untreated case in uk extremely rare uh, okay i used to see asylum seekers some time ago we don't see that now anymore there are but okay. it's very rare the odd one from uk which are uh, you know we are, you know i shouldn't be using the word gypsies they move place to place and then uh, they miss their they're not compliant with ponsetti even after two or three trials so the numbers are uh, numbers are very few just to go back to what uh, uh, dr shinde shingade said we also went through all this many many years ago i used to do the same all those procedures but expectations in different countries are different you have to remember we are in the colder parts of the world uh, at the moment and they all have to wear shoes and socks so the biggest uh, when you talk about proms and functional outcomes you have to look at many other aspects when you look at and we have just done a recent study of using the roy score and most of the complaints from a parent which i'll say next week is on shoe fitting so it's very interesting how uh, and also we know from open surgery there are papers saying that you know at by 40 years 60 to 70% of them are in pain already and significantly stiff so yes your early results may be good but the question is longevity and it's like horses for courses isn't it so in india it's a different expectation so uh, using the ask score from canada may not be the right score uh, for india but using the paver score possibly is more relevant for india than anything else so we all have to uh, the, i know uh, there are no rigid protocols here at the end of the day your patient and you have to decide what is best for you in your scenario in your culture uh, you know that's what i would say yeah i agree with you dr james the philosophy is right when we i'm talking about the older children when you give the casting and when you try to forcefully correct in the cast ultimately it is not a cartilage what ponsetti principle has described isn't it or i'm talking about 12 for 13 or 14 year child yeah, yeah, so absolutely. rather than cramping the the the, the foot with the, the or the bones with the cast why not to do the osteotomy at, at a, you know that is a principle when you're not touching the talus if you touch the talus if you if you are if you are inverting the subtalar joint then it is fine then i can accept the arthritis and all other things but if you are not touching the subtalar joint i think these are the uh, they 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 function they would very well for you the issue is they want a single stage for me for a similar patient who would have been multiply operated i will use a frame and i'll do through osteotomy technique so at the end result is the same we are trying to get a plantigrade foot but by two different methods uh, that's all yeah i think that's the difference because your needs of your patient are different to needs of a welfare state of mind uh, in the uk or oh, even when i come to india i change my philosophy i don't think like i am here so <laughs> you have to realize yeah. it is again horses for courses yeah 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 any thank comment, you dr team uh, dr team any comment yeah. um i i just i just thank 
I just uh, emphasize really a point that um, of all those patients you showed the, of course, with, with excellent function, the ankle joint is perhaps the key here and having a really good ankle joint uh, with good motors around the ankle joint is, uh, is clearly something that, that you've got on those patients. Um, I, I, I do try to avoid going in and doing osteotomies um, on like eight, nine year olds, um, just because I, I tend to find that it's mostly cartilage that I'm going through, not, uh, not bone. Um, which, which I don't know, innately to me feels, uh, uh, feels like I, I'm, I'm doing the wrong thing, but, um, uh, clearly, clearly you've got some outstanding results there. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thank you, Viraj. Now it is already time is two hours. Ashish, would you uh, quickly present your case? Yeah. So, uh, actually. Uh, I am presenting on behalf of uh, Dr. Nikhil. He was supposed to present, but he could not join. So it's a nine-year-old untreated cleft fit. Uh, I think as uh, Alaric was mentioning, type two. So what he did was he did uh, Nikhil did serial casting in OPD. He had six casts, and then uh, he did a posterior medial soft tissue release via the Hemi Cincinnati incision. And that's the result. I've got plantigrade foot. That's the X-ray. And that's how he was. So. Uh, just another way to treat this difficult problem. That's his function. Thank you. Thank you, Asish. Uh, we have the, any question, comments? Uh, I think we have discussed the last half an hour for the untreated club foot in the older child. So I think we can conclude and stop it at here at nine. Yeah. Uh, Okay. To, over yeah. to you, Hashish. Yeah. Can I ask Dr. Team? Dr. Team, it's an excellent work you're doing. So it will be very helpful for us if you have good articles on your power score system because we can use for our neglected cases, you know. So it will be very good if you could have some original articles you could share with us. Thank you. Is is published it in strategies in trauma and limb reconstruction. It is free access journal. Okay. Yeah, you what should you be say, Dr. James? Strategies? Strategies in trauma and limb reconstruction. Is that correct, Tim? Yeah, that's that's right. That's what um, I read it. The, um, the, the, the video which accompanies that uh, is in the process of being updated. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, the, Can I ask the a question? Yeah. Shish? Yeah, please. Yeah. Atul, please. Yeah, Tim, uh, just a quick question. You've been working uh, exclusively with foot in the cure clinic, isn't it? Uh, is, are you doing other uh, pediatric orthopedic stuff as well? Uh, uh, well, uh, the, the the patients that we see um, are, are very, you know, um, majority in fact are, are club foot cases. Uh, we, I, I do do other I do do other things as well. Yeah. Um, uh, so I just want to ask you: Is what's the what's the compliance with bracing like? You know, in the initial. Uh, treatment so when you get a child that infancy you've done the ponsetti the food are looking beautiful and you've got a dedicated team of uh, social workers and a dedicated club food clinic uh, versus you know somebody who like us who do private practice we have, we have uh, a public practice as well where we've got children coming in and out but there's no dedicated follow up apart from counseling the parents so uh, i think under grounds used to run a cure clinic as well so What's the compliance like? You know, if you can ask James as well in the UK, uh, if I can ask you for primary uh, club for treatment, you do the brace failure. What's the brace failure rate? Um, I, I I assume you're asking about the, the I'm sorry, the, the Dennis Brown boots and bar. Yeah, what's the, your compliance uh, yeah. in terms of um, Yeah, so so um, so for, for for Ethiopia, I think it's very poor. I don't think there's 
I don't think there's 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 figures out there that I can quote you actually, um, but certainly there's there's issues surrounding um, not just compliance, but quality production as well, uh, which which also impacts on that. Um, so yeah, but I I, th I think it's I think it's very limited. I mean, past a couple of braces, um, we shouldn't we certainly wouldn't see many patients that have had four years. Atul, uh, yeah, I think about failure rate, I think there are two aspects, I think. One is, of course, true non-compliance from the parents. Second is possibly a suboptimal treatment. Sometimes you may not appreciate the suboptimal treatment or endpoint, and then you go ahead and brace. So in my own practice, which I audited many years ago, I would think I had about 15 to 20% of uh, compliance issues. But this was the study done from my only, I used to do a peripheral clinic in Barnsley. Now Barnsley population is completely different. Similarly, Olde Hay published their paper and I think theirs was about 25 to 30% non-compliance. And we did a very small study, uh, which was very mm -hmm. small, we didn't have the numbers, by putting a little few transducers inside the Boots and Bar and <laughs> it's, it's quite interesting to note that many of these are actually, either the heels are not sitting on it or they're not wearing it. It's like uh, Shanmuga Sundaram spinal braces for TB, MRC a publication. How many of those kids really stood inside their brace? They usually slip out and go and play outside and their parents were out. So it's a similar thing. I think Iowa group is a very different group. I think uh, patients there are totally different. It's a population which does not move anywhere. Uh, their scoliosis results are phenomenal because uh, they don't go anywhere. For them, I don't know whether they know where New York is. So, so it's, 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 I think that's the way you have to look at it. Yeah, Failure rate is you know, quite easy for us as doctors or surgeons, blame the patient. Actually, there would be some part of it is part of us itself where we have not accepted, you know, uh, I think most of you will agree on that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, we, you don't get it right all the time. You have, you have to be, yeah. even I don't get right all the time. So all of us are the same, I'm sure. Yeah. Apart from think, who gets hundred percent results for everything. I don't think the rest of us do. Yeah, I think yes, the bracing is one of those unanswered questions when it comes to club foot treatment. And that's something again, that has intrigued us a lot for several years now. And again, when you're looking at adherence to bracing, you know, what are you actually measuring? Because uh, you're asking parents how many hours are they actually putting the brace? And we are, the, the presumption is that parents are going to be answering honestly. Uh, and it depends who's asking that question. So in countries like India, I'm sure many parents would say, oh, yes, they're using it for the prescribed number of hours and actually using it for maybe a couple of hours or maybe not at all in the day. So I think the only reliable way to do that is by installing sensors within the brace. And there have been a few papers which have come out in the last few years which have shown that the bracing compliance or the adherence to bracing as we call it is far lower measured by the brace by the sensors than what parents actually uh, rec uh, recommend to the parents. And the other question of course is how many years of bracing do we need? How many hours of bracing do we need in a day? And those are all unanswered questions and as far as I'm aware there's a prospective study called FAB24 which is being led by Matt Dobbs which is looking into two different protocols, looking at uh, using it for two years versus using it for four years. And I think they'll be ready to analyze their results and publish them because it was a four-year prospective study that they had undertaken. But whatever the papers came out from the sensors, there have been uh, three papers so far, showed that if you use the brace uh, for at least eight hours, for at least two years, it was sufficient. And that's the paper which has come out um, from Morgenstein and subsequently from uh, other centers as well. And we've recently uh, uh, developed a prototype for, for, for putting sensors within a brace, trying to get low cost sensors, which we can use in low middle income countries, because I think it's the only way to determine objectively uh, whether patients are actually using uh, the braces or not. So I think these are questions which will be answered over the next few years. It's, as we said, so much of still art rather than science within the Ponsetti method. And uh, with more objective data, I'm sure we can be able to answer those questions over time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, next Sunday, we will have a talk on bracing and I'm sure all of us will have more questions. 
uh, before we end, I have one question for Tim. You showed that beautiful video of a child developing hyperextension at the knee. So after treatment, what happens? What's your experience? It it goes away or? Yeah, I think, I think it does. Um, and if you've got a good ankle joint, um, then then that corrects. Uh, if they're able to get into dorsiflexion well, that corrects. Um, and you don't see the hyperextension, uh, and they they lose that. Um, I um, I think my 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 point was that the the rehab of these patients can be can be sped along by some focused um, focused training on particularly core muscles. And that was uh, uh, I think I think uh, I think the hyperextension um, that you see actually will will get better by itself, providing the ankle has got a good range. Thank you. Thank you. Ashish, can I add something? To yes, him? yes, please. Very interesting, because as soon as you showed the video, even our patients, after we do any frame surgery, especially bilateral, they all walk funny, and they do all kinds of funny walks. So actually, it's they lose core stability, exactly what Tim said. And our physios actually work on core stability throughout and uh, it takes about a year before they actually walk properly. Uh, so that, I think it's, it's, uh, it's to some extent driven from the ankle, but quite a lot is loss of core stability and muscle strength in, in and around the hip muscles. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, there was one question from the audience. Any tips uh, to make the cast stay longer and prevent slippage? Dr. Rao has asked this question. Maybe for Mohan then. Is Mohan no, there? Mohan no, could answer that. No, yeah. you can answer. So, sure. So I think if you're talking of uh, the younger or the older one, you know, the older child, of course, uh, it's challenging. But the advantage in the older child is that they're not as chubby as those younger babies are. So in fact, the chance of calf slippage is more in the younger age group I've seen, where you have these very chubby kids in whom the calf is so chubby that it's difficult to really get the plaster on well. So in the younger age, what we tend to do is use a stripe of uh, tincture benzoin. And we find that that helps to hold the soft roll and the cast onto the skin. So we, I, that's something that I tend to do. The other thing, of course, is to bend the knee to 90 degrees or sometimes even a little more in these very chubby children, almost treated like an atypical or a complex club foot, where we need to bend the knee more than 90 degrees in these younger children who are quite chubby. And the thought, of course, is there's no question that a well-fitting cast and a well-molded cast is the best way to avoid cast slip, which I think if you follow these three principles in a younger child, uh, there should not be a problem at all. The older one, as we said, you know, they're less chubby, so the chance of slipping is less. The only reason there when they slip is because of the severe equinus. And hence, uh, we don't use below-knee casts in these older children. I know there are uh, several people who treat older children who believe in only using below-knee plasters. And we don't do that. We use above-knee plasters for even the older child, even if they are 10 and above, for the simple reason that the equinus can be quite severe. And that causes the cast to slip off if you give a below knee cast. So we invariably use an above knee plaster, flex the knee to, to 45 degrees or less. And we find that really helps in the, in the older child. Anything you would like to add, Mohan, to that? Sorry, I, I answered the question on your behalf. No, no, that's fine. Thank you. No, I agree with the points you made. I think the key is when, when, when you do the cast padding, it has to be really conforming, very little space as tight as possible. With Ponsetti keeps, like Mark and it tells me that every time, like Ponsetti used to keep telling him, even though he has spent so many years with him, tighter, tighter, he used to sit in the corner and tell him the cast padding should be as tight as possible. So there should be no space. That's one thing. Secondly, spend more time holding, really like above the calcaneus, around the malleoli, etc. So, there is very little space there. And then the other things you already mentioned, the, the tincture benzoin, bending the knee to 90 or even more, 100. And also another thing I would like to add is quadrilateral molding of the thigh segment. And uh, 
in, 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 the, in the more late presenting and syndromic kids, like quadrilateral molding of the thigh segment rather than a cylinder, you know, would, will help prevent slippage further. And then cast extends all the way to the groin. If you stop just above the knee, rather than going all the way to the groin again, they can slip out. So those are some things I would, I would say. Okay, thank you. Well, if there are no questions, then I think uh, we end this webinar today. Thank you for joining us. And I would like to thank all the faculty for sharing their expertise and tips and tricks. And next Sunday, we'll have another exciting session. We'll be talking about external fixators, divan transfer, tenotomy, and syndrome club. So thank you very much for joining us today. How thank many you. delegates registered, you think? Uh, Ashok? Around 800. Say it again? Around 800, sir. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that's, that's still learning. Huh? They're still it's learning. Open yeah, I mean, maybe I, I would have expected more questions from them, to be very frank. If 800 were on. Yeah. We stream it on various platforms. That's why questions are difficult to claim. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, got it. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.